Hi, it's Dr. Khan coming at you with chapter four. This is the first of three lectures for chapter four and it'll cover sections 4.1 to 4.3. The learning objectives for the first three sections include some historical information talking about the hypothesis of continental drift and how that hypothesis evolved into the theory of plate tectonics. And um, the second section, 4.2, we'll talk more about evidence for continental drift, uh, specifically evidence that's put forth by one scientist named Alfred Wegener. And the third section, the theory of plate tectonics, will introduce you to some of the fundamental concepts of the theory, which really represents the modern understanding or model of how the continents move. So section 4.1, you need to know and take a note here also, there's the learning target for this section is posted at the bottom here. Um, so until the 1960s, which is relatively recently, most geologists believed that the ocean basins and continents did not move. Uh, they were in fixed geographic positions. They also believed that both the continental crust and the ocean basins were very old. This is again now not the current understanding of our continents, but um, pretty amazing to think that it wasn't until relatively recently uh, that this uh, understanding had morphed into a much more complex understanding of the Earth. 4.2 talks about Alfred Wegener, this German clim climate scientist who traveled around and gathered evidence for a new hypothesis that he put forward in 1915 in a book that he published. So his hypothesis, and I, I kind of bolded the word hypothesis here um, to make sure that we're remembering the difference between a hypothesis and a theory. So hypothesis is an idea um, that can be tested and uh, through scientific collection of data is either supported or rejected. And we're gonna see ultimately Wegener's continental drift hypothesis uh, was rejected based on a lack of some aspects of his evidence. Um, so the hypothesis was that there was a supercontinent called Pangaea that began breaking apart around 200 million years ago. And between that time and now, these continents drifted to where they are currently located on the surface of the Earth. And that in order to move to their current positions, the continents must have broken through somehow the underlying ocean crust. This slide here is showing you Alfred Wegener's idea of what Pangaea must have looked like when he published his book in 1915. This was his idea. And then again, a modern construction of what we now understand of the continent supercontinent Pangaea. So we see here that all of our major continents are represented as um, concentrated, a concentrated land mass, which is why we call it a supercontinent. I'm going to encourage you at this point to click on the smart figure for 4.2. This will actually take you to another mini lecture that covers the details that you need to know about Pangaea. You can either access this smart figure through the course module. You'll see an, a place where you can download the PowerPoint file, but there are also links to the smart figure mini lectures that are embedded in here. You can either use those links or you can actually download this presentation file and click on this smart figure 4.2. So at this point, I'd recommend pausing this video in order to pick up on the mini lecture on Pangaea, really important notes in here. Main idea here in terms of continental drift, you're going to need to know Wegener's evidence. And there are four pieces of evidence that Wegener put forward in order to support his hypothesis of continental drift. So the first of which is that the continents appeared to fit together as if they were puzzle pieces. So here's one example here, South America and Africa, fit nicely together. Secondly, that the fossils match across the seas. Hopefully you got some more detail about that in the smart figure video, going into some specifics about 
the types of organisms that were used as fossil evidence by Wegener. And number three, that rock types and structures seem to match across the continents. And again, from the lecture, the smart figure lecture, you should have seen that, that these ranges at the margins of the continents would line up and they'd have similar types of rocks. And ancient climates, this is also something that was discussed in the smart figure video. So I want you to be able to talk about how glacial ice along the tips of the continents here, and then coal swamps. The video mentioned also that these coal swamps would have been most likely to form around the equator so that these can be explained by repositioning the continents uh, down really as a super continent here where the tips of the continents would have experienced glaciation from extreme cold and that we'd have these coal beds around the equator. Ultimately, Wegener's continental drift hypothesis was rejected because there's also evidence that did not support or a lack of evidence to support uh, Wegener's idea. And the biggest issue was there was no way to explain how or why the continents drifted. Again, Wegener put forth the idea that maybe the continents broke through that continent, that ocean crust in order to move to their current positions, but there was no evidence of that. There was no evidence that either the ocean crust was weak enough to be able to be broken apart by the continents or that that had happened. We'd expect to see some evidence of that breaking apart if that's actually what had happened. 4.3 talks about the emerging theory of plate tectonics in the 1960s, and really this was a result of technology advances, and you should know many of those advances are tied to wartime technologies from World War II. So for example, seafloor mapping, our ability to map the seafloor using things like sonar, uh, be able to record earthquakes and estimate their depths, uh, young seafloor that was discovered, again, the idea previously had been that the continents and ocean basins were very old. And then the sediments in the ocean basins are really more the lack of thick sediment deposits in the ocean basins, indicating that they have not been accumulating sediment for a long period of time. So this evidence is important to look at, and we're gonna look at it in a little more detail, but really you're gonna be able to make the connection between why this was so important and stood as evidence for the theory of plate tectonics. You'll look, that, you'll look at that in a little more detail as um, we learn a little bit about the structure of the earth in the future sections. But we'll take a look at a couple of these ideas now. So seafloor mapping revealed a global oceanic ridge system. So a ridge is a, a relative high point. Here we're looking at the earth as if the ocean basins were drained. So we actually see the ocean floor here. And these seams, almost like a seam on a baseball, ran through the ocean basins. And that, again, was a feature that was unknown previously before we had the ability to map those seafloors. So again, we'll make the connection about why that matters in a little bit in the later sections. The second uh, new evidence that had emerged re was related to our ability to map earthquakes. So specifically, we're looking at big earthquakes that were occurring along very deep ocean trenches. So we see this red line here representing an area of great depth in the ocean. And then deep beneath these structures, we are seeing very deep earthquakes occurring. And young seafloor was discovered. So here we have a map of the age of the ocean basins. We can see that the age varies from present time to uh, well, let's see, about 280 million years ago, and we see there's not very much of that. So most of our ocean floor is between this zero age period and around 180 million years old. This is much younger, even though that sounds like a lot, right? 180 million years is, is not a lot in, when you consider the entire evolution of Earth, or the Earth's history, which we call geologic time. So again, much younger than the continental crust, which we'll see is much older. And finally, worldwide marine sediment thickness. So here's a map indicating the thickness of all of the accumulated debris um, that's fallen on the ocean floor. We see most of the ocean here 
is in this blue color, the dark blue or the lighter blue, indicating you know somewhere between zero and at most here in this lighter blue 500 or so meters thick. So we'd expect if the ocean basins were much older that those sediment deposits would be a lot thicker. And the explanation for why this, uh, why we see kind of these new lines of evidence began to form the basis of the theory of plate tectonics. Here we're using the word theory. So a theory in science is a very well supported, well tested idea that has general consensus among, among scientists, especially in the field. Um, so rigid, a rigid lithosphere overlies a weak asthenosphere. And this is really, these two vocabulary words here, the lithosphere and the stenosphere, are important to be able to differentiate between the two. And in fact, that's a learning target for 4.3. And we need to be able to explain the importance of both the lithosphere and the stenosphere in plate tectonics theory. So here they are defined for us. When we say a rigid lithosphere, that means it's, it's not gonna bend. It, it breaks, it doesn't bend. It varies in thickness. You should know that the continental crust is thicker uh, and less dense compared to the ocean. And again, it breaks. That's what rigid means here. The asthenosphere is the layer underneath. It's hotter. It's a weaker region of the mantle. So even though it's solid, it, it's near its melting temperature and it will flow kind of like a, a plastic flow beneath the lithosphere. Again, it's important to be able to differentiate uh, the two and understand the difference between crust and, and lithosphere, et cetera. So it's important that you do click on the smart figure for the mini lecture that goes into more detail about the difference between those layers and its implications for the theory of plate tectonics. After watching that video, you can come back to this point the Earth's major lithospheric plates are drawn here on this map. You can take a minute to examine them. And then I want you to notice down at the bottom, there is a key that's listed for the type of interactions between the different plates. We call those the plate boundaries. So where two plates meet, we're color coded here. So here we have a blue boundary between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. And if we look down at the key, that's a convergent plate boundary. And we see an image of what is happening with those plates, the lithosphere interacting with the asthenosphere. This convergent plate boundary is showing subducting lithosphere, which we'll get more into in the next section. An example of divergent or moving apart, we see a divergent plate boundary that is the seam this ridge in the Atlantic Ocean between North America, South America, and Africa and Europe. So that ridge runs between the two of them and they're divergent, meaning that the plates are moving away from each other. And in a couple of places, including around Southern California, we have this green boundary, which is a transform plate boundary where the plates are actually rubbing up against each other but they're not creating new crust or destroying the crust. It's important to know that the lithospheric plates are constantly in motion. And again, here is a more formal definition for our divergent, convergent, and transform plate boundaries, which we'll dive deeper into in the next section.